So just quickly to tell you what I've done is um, now I'm adding the vegetables. I, I have these like massive zucchini that are growing in our garden right now. So I just cut like chopped up a little portion of it. You, uh, want, you know, use like, you know, a small zucchini, maybe a medium zucchini. Um, I also added again, more garden goodies. I also added a yellow squash. Um, and then these lovely yellow carrots. And I chose yellow to be in the theme of where we are right now. Did you grow um, those, Benita? I did not grow the carrots. I have to, they, I, I need to have some like grading down below or something for the carrots. Um, I think I'm going to try to grow carrots in pots. I grew carrots a couple years ago, but every year the, the pests and the rodents change in terms of who comes to steal from our garden. So, <laughs> you know, every year it's a different thing. So I gotta, I'll try the carrots in another way. They have a plan. They're, they're strategizing. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the thing that I didn't add that I like to add um, too is like, you know, chili pepper of some sort. You can add a little bit of chili. The reason I'm not adding it is I want to give it to my daughter. Sometimes she likes spice. Sometimes sometimes she'll eat the spiciest thing ever. Sometimes she won't. But, <laughs> um, you know, spice is really good for, you know, firing up the digestion. Mm -hmm. But uh, to get back to this concept of the microbiome, so don't take probiotics. What do you do to repopulate your gut? What do you do on a like a regular basis? You go and you breathe outside. We have a plethora. Like yes, that's the air that also has the you know the antibiotics like through chemicals. But like play with soil. Breathe in that soil. Mm. Play with plants. Breathe in the air. Go sniff a tree. You know, <laughs> like get the you know get get all those. Oh, things, you're having you know? it. Yeah, like I do believe in hand washing. Hand washing is great, but like I feel like there's a little bit of the overwashing that's happening out of fear. Like yeah. there's a there's just so much there. So you know, one of the things that Bush, Doctor Zach Bush, says is to breathe it in because when we breathe it in, we're bringing it into our upper respiratory system. Mm -hmm. That's then in fact that is then kind of impacting our gut as well. So like breathe it in. But if you want Miso. Miso is actually one of the most important foods for bacterial properties because what this is, is fermented food. So all fermented foods like have a little bit, but what you want is a wild ferment, not the ferments that are using these three monocultures of bacteria to ferment their food. You know, you want to have a wild ferment. Like that's why sourdough is like such a great thing for local environments, right? Like you're getting the bacteria from your local air and it's really, it's, it's going to make you interact with the nature that's around you. Mm -hmm. But miso is, um, he talked a lot about miso. And honestly, I never really gave miso much thought until I started listening to what he was saying. And he was, you know, it's a soybean. So some people are like, oh, I don't want soy. But it's not soybean anymore. Because with this kind of culturing, this constant fermenting, it's bacteria that is like, you know, for breaking down the soybean so that there's nothing. And then they're eating their micronutrients that they, they're basically eating their poop, they're, you know, <laughs> but they're eating the micronutrients they produce and redigesting that and redigesting that and redigesting that. Now you can get miso that's like a year fermented. You can get miso that's 20 year fermented. Now that obviously has more like a sour, you know, more pungent taste, I guess. But like, the more digested it is, the more micronutrients you're bringing into you. So miso is great. Also, like I was saying, like wild ferments, like I like to make my own pickle, but you can also buy different ones. This one's called Wild West. A lot of these sauerkrauts and, you know, kimchi and stuff, mm -hmm. they, they use like specific monocultures. I'm telling you, look for the wild ferments. You can find them in your farmer's market. You can find them in the grocery stores. So yeah. just start thinking about that. Yeah. And then when it comes to things like cleaning, like, you know, no need to go buy the antibacterial soap or whatever, and the antibacterial cleaners. You know, like I, I told you, you can make, um, you know, I put orange peels and lemon peels into white vinegar. Let this sit for like two weeks. And then put it into a spray and you can use, you know, essential oils like melaleuca, tea tree oil is like one of the greatest, 
you know, things for wound care, for like cleaning wounds and getting rid of bacteria and like, you know, things like lemon and wild orange, you know, you can talk to Jenny Biondo about that. She'll tell you a lot more about essential oils and she'll know all the details about it. But take the white, you know, take this white vinegar with this orange peel in it, add a little bit of tea tree oil, add a little bit of some of the scents, you know, and, and spray it on your countertops, you know, that, that's your cleaner. Love Clean it. your floors with it. So Mary saying Sandor Katz wrote a great book, Wild Fermentation. Ooh, I love it. Oh, I think I know that book. That's a great book. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, for, for suggesting that. Yeah. Mary is a, is a midwife. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. All right. So I'm just stirring this around. Like I said, um, you want to just, you know, have it for about like 30 minutes um, covered so that you can get the rice and the lentils going a little more. And then um, I'm adding in these vegetables a little later because you can add the vegetables earlier. But what you're going to do is... See, this one here, you can see, like, I really cook down the vegetables. You can have the vegetables yeah. completely cooked down, but then when you have them completely cooked down, they provide flavor and some nutrition, but you don't get all of it because when you overcook vegetables, you kind of break down those nutrients as well. So I like to add some of the vegetables a little later so that they're not completely broken down so that, you know, there's a little bit more. But there's nothing wrong with completely cooking it down in something like kitchery. Kitchery should be this kind of, like, you know, beautiful kind of, um, smooth, not smooth, but like, you know, easy to digest texture. It's, it, it could be like mush, but it's not like mush because the, the lentils still hold some texture to it. So beautiful. Looks delicious. So, oh yeah. I know. I wish I could share this with everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. All right, so I'm just gonna, you know, I just keep giving it a quick stir so that it doesn't burn on the bottom. Now, like I said, once you add the miso, you want to make sure that it's not boiling because when you boil miso, you kind of take away those properties. Um, oh, one of the other things that I have, and thank you for bringing up the recipe because now you're reminding me, you can add whatever vegetables you like, right? You can add things like sweet potato. It's also a great way to add in vegetables that maybe you don't really eat so often, like turnips or parsnips. At least I don't eat them often. Maybe you eat them often. But, um, you can add things like, you know, turnips or parsnips or sweet potato. If you use something that's like a more hard root vegetable, you want to put it in with the rice and the lentils so it has more cook time because you want it to break down. But the, the things like carrots and squash, they break down really easily. So you don't want to have them have too long of a cook time. At least you don't have to. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so what we have here are, you know, we, for this, what I've done now is four different ways, I think four, four different ways of breaking down the lentils and breaking down that rice so it doesn't cause irritation in your stomach. We soaked it for half an hour and got rid of the anti-nutrients that are in there. We added um, a cipatita so that that also helps break it down. The kombu helps break it down. And the miso is kind of like, it, it helps with the digestive power, I should say, and gives you a lot of micronutrients. Um, so this, you know, this is the beautiful thing. Like, you know, when you eat really good Indian food, when you eat um, Indian food that's been done well, you don't leave feeling bloated. Now, there's a lot of restaurants. This is why I hate going to Indian restaurants is because I do leave feeling bloated. So <laughs> this is where, you know, you know how things were cooked. You can tell by, like, how the food was prepared because the lentils and the different beans and things like that and even, you know, various legumes, like if you had cabbage or something, it shouldn't cause that gassiness. And it wouldn't cause that gassiness if they use the blend of spices um, and the proper techniques for that. And that's when you know it's like home cooked food. Yeah. I've heard the gut being referred to as the second brain. Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, all of our organs have neuronal fibers, right? But the gut supposedly has the most neuronal fibers. Yeah. That, so, or, that, mm -hmm. yeah. So I was going to say it's the second brain because, um, you know, this is where we're producing 
a lot of the neurotransmitters and hormones that we associate with the brain, right? Mm -hmm. So we talk about serotonin being produced in the brain. Actually, the gut produces more serotonin than what's in the brain. So these are the happy chemicals, the things that make us happy. It actually happens in our gut. Mm -hmm. And this is where it comes back down to that gut feeling, that intuition, mm -hmm. right? Because we have all those neurotransmitters that are stimulating our gut saying, hey, that's good. Hey, that's bad. Hey, I'm not so sure about this. Like mm -hmm. that's all there because all of those things that produce the signals in our brain are in our gut. Mm -hmm. It's really fascinating. Yeah. And we have actually, you know, we've dulled a lot of our gut receptors. We've dulled a lot of this by the foods that we eat, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, just by overeating. You know, one of the one of the Ayurvedic principles. I don't know if people know what Ayurveda are, are Ayurveda is. Like, I think people have heard the term Ayurveda, but Ayurveda is the science of being. It's an ancient, like it's it's basically ancient Indian medicine. And this is where like, you know, yoga and all of these things also are incorporated within Ayurveda. It's not just about like, it's not, it's not like, you know, refined health that's in categories, you know, but um, obviously it deals a lot with food and nutrition and things like that. And one of the things they say uh, in Ayurveda is that you should only eat to 80% full because if you're a hundred percent full, you've over, you, you've pretty much oversaturated yourself. If you get to the point of feeling that I'm full, then you're losing your power. You're losing that power in the solar plexus. You're blocking that chakra because now you're just like lethargic and you need to digest and you need to lay down. You need to open up your pants. You need to like do all those things that make you feel like you've lost your power. Mm. Yeah. And it just reminds me of my own experience of eating to not feel. <laughs> yes. Right? The one way we know ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, it's like when when what you're feeling is really hard to feel. I mean, I learned that very young in my life. So I know food was the way that um you know, my mom would give me love because mm -hmm. she wasn't around. Um she, you know, she was a doctor, she is a doctor. She's a doctor and um, you know, this was back in the day when like rotations and residencies and whatnot are like 72 hour shifts and she would drive two hours away for that. And so I, um, I, ba I didn't see my parents a lot at all through my childhood. And, um, you know, she would show me love by feeding me. That was what she did. And it was almost like an over prescription of it because that was what she was she was just trying to like cram it all into a small period of time and you know it would always be the unhealthy foods because that's what i liked right like any child's taste buds are going to be stimulated by salt sugar fat you know mm -hmm. and so i was eating you know and i would eat my way through my feelings and like that mm -hmm. was what i did throughout even through adulthood and through you know until i started really getting into i mean i've always been into body consciousness partially because I've had poor digestion most of my life. So I've had to be very aware of the foods and I would have, like, I would know things are bad for me, but I would still emotionally eat, you know, like there was that need, as you said, to cover up the emotions, to cover up that feeling mm -hmm. because once you numbed it, you couldn't think about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's interesting to think about like, how do you, um, yeah. Like how do you shift away from that to, just satiate to that 80% and then tolerate the difficult emotions, right? Like sit with that. Um, that sounds, that seems like a really big shift to not eat to that fullness, let yourself feel what you're feeling and do what? Isn't it, isn't it an interesting thing? Like I feel like the thought's definitely a modern Western problem. This idea of eating to levels where we don't oh, yeah. right. feel like it's another way we numb ourselves, right? Yeah. Like the excess, yeah, that total excess, that consumption, that you know. Yeah. And I remember um, somebody used to say, "What was it like?" Um, 
it's either waste in your body or waste outside. When you, when you, when you have like too much food, like it's the idea of making just enough, eating just enough, having the right amounts for yourself. And it's like, you know, you're told to finish your plate of food, but there's that problem of like, if you take those five extra bites, it's actually wasting in your body. You're not getting nutrition from it because you've stopped your digestion. Your digestion now is like this like slow churn. It can't, it can't fire up. It doesn't have the firepower. And then you just excrete most of it. And, you know, and all you've done is store fat at that point. Yeah. So it's waste outside the body and waste inside the body. And this is why it's really important to like start paying attention to what the proper amount of foods are, especially now that, you know, we're opening back up and you can go back out into the world to some degree a little bit, you know, be safe in like restaurants and whatnot. But like if you eat in a restaurant, sometimes those portions are out of control, right. you know? Right. And there's this desire. We eat with our eyes and we're so hungry and we're like, oh, I'm going to eat it all. And that's, you know, this is where we've got to start like paying attention to what that full response in our body is. Mm -hmm. What is that, that? What is that point that your body's like, okay, I've had enough. And now you're just eating with your taste buds because your taste is like, mm, that tastes so good. Mm -hmm. Like what are the habits you can develop that will help you to recognize that moment, that moment of like, I'm full, I don't need anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And what else can I connect to that feels meaningful? Yeah, and I think that's an important aspect of eating that we totally lost is that connection to other people, to the food, to everything, right? We eat unconsciously. We just we just shovel food in our mouth. We eat yeah. while like looking at our phones, while reading a book, while, you know, watching something. And there's that aspect of if you eat more consciously, like you take a bite. And, um, you know, one of my teachers um, from like 20 some years ago, he had already passed when um, when I like joined the lin like when I entered the lineage. Um, but he said that you should always drink your solids and chew your liquids. Mm -hmm. And it's because you want to be paying attention to the food, breaking it down. I mean, our enzymes, our digestion begins in our mouth. Right. So when you smell your food, when you look at your food, when you give thanks to your food, you're stimulating the enzymes all along, you know, in your digestive tract, in your mouth, everywhere. And then as you chew, when you chew consciously, you're really stimulating the digestive power so that by the time it's getting to your stomach, you're really providing its full nutrition. Mm -hmm. Now, something like pitchery is helping you with that process because the cooking mm -hmm. is breaking it all down for you so that by the time it reaches the stomach, it's really easy to digest. And so if you're not eating something like pitchery, this is where it's important to really be conscious of like, chewing. Now, you don't have to sit there and count the number of times you're chewing, but I think that for, it's amazing how often we just like couple, couple chews and swallow. Next bite, yeah. couple chews and swallow. Yeah, so mindful eating and yeah. being in relationship with your food and your eating experience. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's, again, it's just like linking back to, we were talking about like isolating nutrient or isolating food, but also like what happens as human beings that we're isolated. And so it just all feels really connected to, you know, with consumption and overeating and isolation. And that yeah. there's really like a need to be in connection with our food, be in connection with each other. Absolutely. You know, I've been, you know, since we've been doing this chakra series and, you know, Jenny Biondo and uh, Delia Yvette, they talk about the chakras. They, they they have their episodes the week before ours and they talk about the, you know, the chakras and the different properties along with essential oils and crystals and all the important aspects of it. And one of the things that, like, you know, I think about as we've been going through these series is really like, looking at you know the reflection of the outer world and our inner world you know we've been stuck as a society as a humanity in our lower three chakras right like you know issues with you know grounding to the earth this idea of i am who am i like my connection to my ancestors to my family to like you know my sense of self and then the the sacral chakra this idea of feeling allowing ourselves to feel like feel our 
you know, feel and create, and then getting into this empowerment, the I can, I can do this. And if you think about everything that's going on in the world and everything that we've been taught by, I feel like modern day society, it's about numbing all of that. Don't be who you are, fit into society, be part of the pack. Like, don't be like this individual. And if you are an individual, you've got to be the best. You've got to like lead everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. So like getting that, don't feel your emotions. Let's numb them. Have as many, you know, substances to numb that. And don't, don't feel like, feel shameful of your moon cycles. Feel shameful of these things. And this idea of I can, like, I feel like we're constantly told I can't, you know, like you can't do this. You can't do that. And I, and I always have to catch myself with my daughter, like this mm -hmm. idea of what am I programming in her? Like, you know, it's not that she can't do this. It's a matter of like, what is the best idea around this? Should you do this or should you do that rather than I can't do it? And I feel like so much of what's happening in the world is, is in those three. And when we're so stuck at the bottom, we can't raise up. We're not aligned all the way through. And our heart is where we love, right? This is where we connect our lower world with our upper world. And when we're fully aligned and we're connected at our heart, we can express ourselves through our throat chakra. This is the expression of who we are. And then we're like connecting with this other sense of the world and raising our vibrations up. But the, the top part is about the expression and the lower part is like this sense of self and this grounding and our empowerment. And where we've been really stuck is We've been using this gut like we should achieve, we should do, like, and like when it's out of balance, we have things like, you know, senses of insecurity, like not feeling motivated, not knowing your life purpose when we're out of balance in our solar plexus. I feel like so many of members of society and like including myself are stuck there. And then we're also told to use our intellect, to use our brain. And because we've disconnected from our heart, we're trying to use these in isolation. And when we do, we're not really achieving much. This is why we're so out of balance. Rather than using the mind as a, you know, as a direct reflection of you know, our intuition, right? Like it should be our heart leading, using our intuition, our gut sense, and letting the heart lead so that the mind can know how to enact what's going on, like what, what we're thinking about, you know? And it's it's fascinating to think about, you know, we we look at these as an individual level, but we can look at it as a societal level too, to really understand our relationship to the world. Mm, thank you for that, Vanita. It's very powerful. The chakras are powerful. <laughs> Let's clear the line. <laughs> and, and eat yummy food. I know. I wish I could share this food with you. So it's cooking down. Um, and, you know, like I said, you want to get this into a really stewy mixture. I think it's going to be like mostly there by the time we finish. Um, but I think that what we're gonna, like I would let it cook down a little more. Again, like you can stop this at any point, like the rice and lentils are cooked. Now it's about letting it break down further, you know, letting letting it kind of be a little bit more um, soft, I guess. So like I said, that it's easy to digest. So it's not that you would need to let it cook longer because it's not cooked. You would just want it to cook longer so that it's fully cooked. Now you can see even in this picture, like the lentils are still whole. And when you eat them, there's a, there might be a little bit of texture to them um, if you want it that way, or you can actually have it as complete mush. It is up to you. That's the beauty of it. But by this point, by it about 45 minutes to, you know, an hour, it is fully cooked. I mean, it's, it's cooked at about like 45 minutes or so. But, you know, longer than that is, again, for more of that digestive fire, getting into like what we're trying to achieve. And for the, you know, for the solar plexus. And like I said, this is something that, you know, if you are fasting, if you ever do a fast, so whether it's like, a, especially an extended fast, like a three day fast or a five day fast, um, uh, if you are sick, if you're feeling any sort of cold coming on, any sort of like stomach cramps or like, you know, anything like that, this is the perfect food to eat because it's so gentle on the stomach mm -hmm. and you feel full and you feel nourished with so little. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to 
eat much. So like after a fast, it's great because what you're doing is like by breaking the fast, you want to have something that you can incorporate the nutrients, give your body that vitality without feeling like you're dulled exactly what you just cleared out. You know, one of the problems with fasts is that people then go right back to eating normally again. And then you've cleared out your system and then just shoved it right back into its, you know, stress state. So, you know, think about light foods, think about, you know, and, and Kitchery is great for that. And, you know, as um, you saw with the recipe earlier, you don't need that many ingredients. All the extra ingredients are for more flavor and more oomph and, you know, all the wonderful things. And, you know, I use vegetable broth because, again, that has a lot of micronutrients in it um, and it has a lot of flavor, but you can use water. I mean, you know, this is... Every recipe, make your own. And you can see like the, the highlighted yellow stars are the only things that are like essential. And there's only probably like seven ingredients. The rest of it, play with it. Make it your own, find what you like. And you know me, I always say play with your food. So. Yeah, you do. So at this point, what this is, is like the water has gone down, like the liquid has gone down. And um, like I said, it's it's like really good, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it here and um, let it be. But if I were making like you know a really digested or like broken down kitchery, I probably would add you know probably I don't know maybe like another cup of water and let it go, or I mean another cup of broth and let it go for another 15 to 20 minutes. But for the sake of time, there's you know no need to do it and it's, and it's wonderful as is. So I am going to turn this off and we are going to start it. Mm, all right. Okay, if I can find my bowl. Aha, uh -huh. I covered it up. <laughs> All right. So what foods do you like to eat after like, you know, a fast or if you're sick? Um, broth. Yeah. And now you're reminding me uh, of miso because I always, yeah. yeah, I always keep miso paste in my fridge, but I keep it all the way in the back. And so sometimes I forget about it. But yes, I'm a big fan of broth. And I'll keep a container of broth at work. Um, yeah, like rice, broth. I'll sometimes put some broth in rice and eat that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, miso soup is so good. Like, you know, for people who are not used to fasting or don't like want to try fasting out and they haven't yet, things like miso soup are really good throughout the day. Like if you want to, you know, there's many types of fasts. You can, you know, you can just reduce your food load. But if you're if you're going into like a really full on fast and you want something that's going to feel like you've had something, like you've eaten something, miso mm. soup is really good for that. Yeah. And you can buy the soup packets. You don't have to like have paste, you know, you can do that too. Yep. All right. So I am actually going to serve this, you know, garnished. Um, so here, can you see? Yeah, that's so beautiful. It looks just so, like, it looks just like the picture. Thank you. I try to show that like the pictures are not done to like be <laughs> this stylized whatever that you can't make this like this is what is being made this is what you're doing let's do a side by side comparison of the picture there can we do that yeah, i think <laughs> yeah, i'm trying to do it yeah I'm that's all good oh yeah we got the yellow hat we can see the yellow hat there the same <laughs> color yeah <laughs> i would tilt this more but i don't want this all to fall on the floor so, <laughs> so good beautiful but you can you know, you can garnish with anything you like. Here I used um, unsweetened coconut uh, flakes, um, cilantro. Now I know Delia loves to talk about cilantro. I love cilantro too. I, I mean, it's cilantro. cilantro. You know, I feel so sorry for the people who can't eat cilantro. <laughs> it's like some gene in the olfactory system, the smell that makes cilantro taste like soap. I am so <laughs> sorry for them because it is like used in almost every culture and nice. it is so good. <laughs> but if you don't, if you can't eat cilantro, you know, leave it out. 
other things that I like to garnish with are like things like sesame seeds or ground flax. I mean, whatever you want, whatever, you know, you're looking for in terms of flavor and texture. I use the lemon because lemon is going to add that acid and that spark um, to it. The other thing that I like to do is like, you know me, I can never get enough turmeric. You know, I have turmeric curcumin mm -hmm. tattooed on me. Yeah. I have cayenne tattooed on me. But um, I like to take fresh turmeric mm -hmm. and I use a microplane. This is a this is a thing called the microplane. And I just um, zest the turmeric. Hold on, I just dropped that one so we get another one. <laughs> That's okay. I think I have a child incoming here. All right. Um, so I'm just going to grate the turmeric real quick and then that's it. You can add, you know, it adds more color to your dish. You can kind of see it in that picture a little bit, but, um, anyway, like turmeric is the all around good for your health and everything. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. I am so glad that we were able to discuss so many important topics to me, including intuition and gut health. As I mentioned, this weekend's a powerful weekend of manifestation. Really set your intentions, like the swan card told us, to really find your time to like ground yourself, go solo, find, you know. The Modern Witch Movement is having Witch Camp this weekend. Join it. It's going to be amazing workshops. You can check out the Modern Witch Movement for that. Next week, we have Delia and Jenny back for the next chakra. We're finally moving into the heart where we can yeah. love. And then we'll be back after that. So mm -hmm. thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ariel. Thank it was you, so Benita. Love it. It's time to you again. So good. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.